welcome to your first lecture on sensation. This one we're going to go over some basic terminology and ideas that you need to just kind of put everything else into context. First thing we talk about is what is a sensation? And if I asked you to sit in a room for just about a minute and do nothing, just experience being in the room, what would you see, feel, hear, maybe even smell or taste? What did you tune out and what did you become more aware of? All of that is a really good understanding of sensations that are impacting us and how we respond to being bombarded constantly with different senses from our environment. What is a sensation? It's the process by which our sensory systems and our nervous system receive stimuli from our environment. Sensation isn't our understanding. It's the raw information coming at us, impacting us. And there's really two ways that we utilize sensation. We either process from the bottom up or we process from the top down. Let's start with bottom-up processing. I think it's kind of funny that I chose this picture. Imagine a cat trying a lollipop for the first time. Well, strangely enough, cats don't have sensory detectors for sweet, but imagine what the cat would be experiencing, what the texture would be like, the taste, whatever it is, what is the cat experiencing? It's going from pure sensation to trying to figure out what it's interacting with. Does it like it? Does it not like it? Bottom-up processing is any time you experience something essentially for the first time and you're going from raw information trying to figure out what it is that you're dealing with. This is going to be heavily conducted by the nervous and sensory systems. The first time you saw the letter A, your brain had to bottom-up process. It didn't have a name or a label or even a sound that associated with this symbol. It just saw two angled lines and a horizontal line. Your brain broke it down into its basic elements and the next time you saw that, you knew you'd seen it before. Top-down processing is a little different. This is using our already established expectations and experience and it's used to help us figure out what we should expect in a situation. This is actually the kind of the baseline for perception. So if I asked you guys to read the information off to the side, you would read my phone number is area code 555-876-1569 please call me. You're using top-down processing, not just at the speed at which you're recognizing the words and understanding it, but the fact that the S and the 5 are written the exact same way, and you're still treating the S when it's with letters as a letter, and the minute it switches over to numbers or a code, you're treating it as a number. No one's reading this. My phone number is area code SSS 8761S69. Please call me or flipping the S's to fives. We're using our previous experience and expectations to tell us that once we get to the part that says area code, flip to numbers. Here you see the word the cat, or at least you should. Now, you could read it if you're reading the H and the A as being the exact same symbol as the ch -t or tay cat, but neither of those make sense, so we top down process. The only thing that really makes sense in this context is the cat. That's the way English works for us. Those symbols are the same, but in the context and with the surrounding letters, we treat it differently. The next concept that we're going to go into is something called thresholds. And thresholds are minimum amounts. The minimum amount of stimulation that you need to detect any kind of sensory stimulus, and maybe the minimum amount of stimulation that you need to detect a change in a stimulus. The first one, absolute thresholds, are the minimum amount of sensory information that we need in our environment to detect that something is there. So, in an absolutely silent room, how loud does the ticking of a watch have to be for you to notice the ticking? In an absolutely pitch black room, how bright does the light need to be for you just to faintly detect that it exists? That's your absolute threshold, and it needs to be there at 50% of the time. If I asked you flip a coin, what are the chances it'll land heads or tails, you would say 50-50. In this case, 50% is our benchmark, our baseline for chance. It has to happen just above chance for us to say that it's a threshold. There's another one called a difference threshold. In a difference threshold, we want to know how much do we need to add to something to notice a change. So here you have a whole bunch of jars filled with colored water. If I wanted to see if the red became redder, or if I wanted to change the color, how many drops 
of red would I have to add to the blue before you could tell me that you noticed a color change? Would it be one drop, two drops, three? An easier way of looking at this is let's say you got into your car and you always keep the volume on your radio at a 25. Your friend gets in the car and as you're driving, you're not paying attention, they turn your volume up to 26. Did you notice the change? They turn it to 27. Did you notice the, the change? They turn it to 28, 29. Finally at 30, you tell them, hey, stop messing with the radio. It took five different whatever increments of sound you have on your radio for you to notice the change. If they were to run this over and over again for a couple of days in the week, you might notice that you have that difference, that you need to have an increase in the volume by five points for you to notice or just notice that they had changed the sound on your radio. Absolute is just when did you notice it in your environment. Difference, it's already there. Have you noticed a change? Weber's law is a law that applies to difference thresholds. It states that every sensation has a minimum constant percentage of change that is required for you to detect a difference. So if we were looking at Weber's law, I could put 50 pennies in your hand and I could add one penny to the pile and that would be just enough for you to detect that the weight had changed. But if I asked you to go bench press 100 pounds and I add a penny to that 100 pounds, you wouldn't detect a change. If weight change has to be within 2% for us to detect it, if I put a two pound plate on that barbell and you went from 100 pounds to 102 pounds, according to Weber's law, you would just notice that the weight had increased. So for a very small stimulus, you may only need a small change to notice it, but it should still stay constant because if you change a large stimulus, the change should be in proportion or constant. And so two pounds versus a penny, they're constant in reference to the original starting stimulus. Signal detection theory, that actually says there's no such thing as an absolute threshold. So we go back a couple and we realize absolute threshold, we were talking about the minimum amount of stimulus that needs to be there in an environment for you to detect it 50% of the time. Well, this theory says there's no such thing as an absolute threshold. There is no absolute minimum. It actually says that there are three things that can influence it. How strong is the stimulus? Was there anything else competing with your attention or competing with the stimuli? And were you prepared or were you anticipating it? This all comes from a study with people who are actually using radars to detect signals. But the reality is, is that we can look at this in a multitude of scenarios. Do you hear your phone ring while you're playing video games? Maybe not, but do you hear your phone ring when you are waiting for an important call while playing video games? Possibly. There's gonna be other factors than just the stimulus itself that impacts whether or not we detect it. Anytime we say something is subliminal, it's below the threshold, that 50% mark that we talked about for absolute thresholds. We'll spend a little bit of time looking at this in class, but it's important to note that subliminal messages are not mind control. They can't make you do something you wouldn't normally do. And the most that they can do is maybe have a slight impact on how you perceive something or maybe even your emotional state. But it can't all of a sudden turn you into a mindless zombie. Just a few more terms to get through. One is sensory adaptation. When we adapt to something, we get used to it. When we get used to it, we start to ignore it. So with sensory adaptation, it's our ability to be constantly bombarded by a stimulus to the point where we're like, we're so used to it, we don't pay attention to it anymore. So for those of you with really long hair, do you notice the hair laying on your neck anymore? If you always wear your watch, do you notice or even register that the watch is on your skin? If you're wearing socks, do you notice the socks that you're wearing or the shoes on your feet? Those things are in constant contact with our skin or with our body. And so it's constantly sending the same message to our brain. Eventually our brain needs to process more important things. So it just adapts and goes, hey, you're there, I got it. I'm not gonna pay attention to you. My dad used to always tell me that if I wanted to get used to a swimming pool really, really quick, even if the water was cold, jump into the pool, it'll eventually warm up. And while that seems like maybe okay advice, the reality is, is that I never warmed a pool up with my body heat. What happened was I became less and less sensitive to the constant message of the water's temperature. 
until my brain just stopped paying attention to it. In other words, I jump into a pool that's 65 degrees. The pool doesn't change just because you added one human body to it. If we were that warm, I would make my cup of tea by sticking my finger in a cool cup of water and my body heat would warm that up quickly to a nice 97, 98 degrees. The reality is we just don't do that. So it wasn't that the water warmed up, it's that my brain stopped paying attention to that constant message of how cold I was. The other thing that you're going to notice is that sometimes your house doesn't smell like anything to you, but somebody else says, oh, your house smells like, well, that's sensory adaptation. If you were in class and you hear that humming of the projector and you stopped hearing it after a while, the projector didn't get fixed or get quieter. You just stopped paying attention to that repeated stimuli. We also have something called selective attention, and this almost feels like the opposite of sensory adaptation. Selective attention is our ability to focus to the exclusion of all else on a single stimuli. When we're talking about selective attention, we are really good as humans at being serial processors, paying really strong attention to one thing and then switching to something else. We don't really multitask. It's not in our wheelhouse. There's about 2.5% of the global population that we can consider multitaskers. So selective attention, when do you use it? Well you use it all the time. If you were driving your car and you had the radio going and you had friends in the car and you were looking for a very specific street, there have been plenty of really bad comedians that have used this as a joke. Why do you turn the radio down when you're, well, when something is really attention consuming, you try to limit or cancel out all of the other things that compete for your attention. So when you're driving, the conversation of your friends competes for your attention. The radio playing competes for your attention you're better at serial processing, so you'll ask everyone to be quiet and maybe even turn on the radio so you can intently focus on the street signs that you're trying to read and understand. But selective attention comes up other places. Say you're at a pep rally. While you're at the pep rally, there's lots of outside noise, but you're trying to have a conversation with your friend. You will spend all of your energy focusing just on their voice to the exclusion of others and actually be able to maintain a conversation. If you couldn't selectively attend, you would have to attend to all of the stimulation in that room at the same time, and it would be pure and utter chaos. ADHD is a very specific disorder that we can talk about when talking about selective attention. Now, some people will say this is a different form of cognition, a different way of brains activating and understanding information, and some people see it as a disorder. What we do know with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is that it's a limitation in the ability to use selective attention. Instead of utilizing selective attention, people with this disorder attend to everything or they find it very difficult to process out information. Scientists know little about the causes, but they do understand that this is biologically based. Studies have shown that there are differences in the prefrontal cortex of the brains of children with ADHD relative to other kids. Now remember that prefrontal cortex is incredibly important with decision making and focus. That along with your striatum, basal ganglia, and cerebellum, those structural differences impact how easily it is for a child to pay attention. Additional research shows that children with ADHD have lower activity levels in the areas of the brain that control things like attention, social judgment, and movement in comparison to non-ADHD peers. And again, those are three different behaviors that are heavily, heavily dominated by the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe takes on those responsibilities. In addition, the neurotransmitter dopamine is really important to attention. Dopamine is what tells us that this was probably something that would have saved our lives or was biologically important, or it's something that we really enjoy and we should come back to again. Well, people with ADHD, have fewer receptors for dopamine in their brain, or they don't produce the same levels of dopamine, which means that a lot of people with ADHD will take a special medicine that is dopamine related. It's most likely going to be a mimic of dopamine. We would call that an agonist. So when we're looking at something like this and we're looking at selective attention, it's not something that everyone just easily or naturally does. In the next two videos, we'll talk about vision and then we'll talk about all the other senses.